Good morning, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, I would like to thank you all for joining this training program. Um, I hope by the end of this uh, training program uh, you will be able to use Visual Sim to uh, use for your project work or for your um, uh, explorations that you are conducting right now. So for today's program I, I'm actually considering uh, a very basic introduction to uh, Visual Sim Architect itself and I'm going to walk you through some demo examples and also I'll be uh, providing you a kind of hands-on experience on using Visual Sim Architect itself. Uh, I'll be creating uh, simple example models to give you a feel about how quickly you can construct models and understanding some of the basic concepts of uh, uh, the modeling environment itself and also how you can choose uh, the library blocks itself to make uh, a, a meaningful model. My name is Ranjit. I'm a senior application engineer with uh, Mirabilis Design and I, I'll be a host for today's webinar. I strongly recommend you to open the link that I have provided over here and also I believe we have sent you uh, these link details as an email as well. So the purpose of providing you this particular uh, link is to access a, a block diagram editor in which you can uh, create uh, a simulation models from uh, your web browser. You don't really have to install the software and uh, have to have a license or something like that. If you have a working version of the tool with you, you can uh, uh, open up that uh, tool and start working with that. So if you do not have the software installed on your PC, so I strongly recommend you to open up this link uh, using an Internet Explorer or a Firefox uh, browser. So a few logistics. Um, uh, there is a chat window on your right hand side of the screen. Uh, if you come across any questions or if you have any doubts, anything uh, specific, you can post in your questions in the chat window. Uh, I can immediately answer those questions and uh, I can uh, proceed further. So the outline for today's uh, training program is to, I will be starting off by explaining why exactly uh, modeling is required and what are the benefits that are that you're going to get out of uh, system level modeling. And I'll be explaining you some of the concepts such as what exactly a data structure means and what, what are the kind of regex expressions that we use and how do I select the library block to model my system for, for the kind of analysis that I'm looking for and what will be the utilization or what is the benefit of the, having a parameter in the uh, system itself. Um, today I'll be going mainly over three tutorials. Um, out of these two tutorials, um, uh, three tutorials, two are, uh, we have actually provided a detailed step-by-step -step guide to build up these models and conduct explorations, uh, the first one and the third one. Whereas the second one is actually a very simple uh, tutorial. I'm going to build that particular model and I'll walk you through that uh, example uh, that is fairly uh, easy one. If you open up that uh, previous link that I posted or that I have given you will actually uh, you will be taking into a page that consists of a, uh, a links to these two uh, uh, tutorials and I strongly recommend you to go to that particular link and uh, uh, that actually helps you to follow uh, the step-by-step -step modeling uh, process itself. So, um, to talk about purpose of modeling exercise itself, the major idea behind a uh, constructing a simulation model uh, in the early stages of your design process is to make sure that you are selecting the right component and you are making the hardware architecture in the right direction and uh, you are providing the configurations to meet your performance and power requirements and trying to perform your hardware and software partitioning to meet your performance and power trade-off requirements, what you're expecting. And also this provides you a kind of a complete visibility into your complete system architecture itself and allows you to uh, conduct various uh, 
uh, use cases and uh, workloads you can run on these virtual platforms and try to understand what is the kind of uh, uh, system behavior that you're uh, looking for and what you're getting out of a, a constructed model. Okay, and also this enables you to capture the kind of bottlenecks that you could uh, come across maybe uh, later in the design process, maybe after implementation and things like that as well. As you know that if you, uh, if the kind of limitations or bottlenecks are identified later in the design process, the problems associated with that and cost associated with that is uh, extremely high and you need to identify the bottlenecks and problems uh, at the system level itself and uh, while doing your architectural decisions itself you need to capture as much as possible uh, the faults and error scenarios. So with that uh, brief introduction to why exactly you do the modeling and why exactly uh, or what is the purpose of doing a modeling, I would like to start off with a basic uh, tutorial and I'll be starting off with this uh, performance modeling of a priority based system resource. For example, you can consider a bus architecture itself. So in, in, in your bus, what you would typically have is you will actually having a uh, queue there and you will be having an arbiter. So based on the arbitration algorithm that you have and based on the uh, priority uh, basis how it is running, Arbiter will actually take up the transactions that are sitting in the queue and it will send out to the uh, slave side or it could be on the other, other way around as well. So in this case what I'm going to do is I'm going to model this scenario, for example the transactions coming from the processor or the requests coming from the processor uh, which are going to be placed on a queue uh, in, in your bus and then I'm going to consider a very simple arbiter as well. And then um, I'm going to compute what is the delay associated with this particular uh, bus arbitration scheme itself. So in this case, we're going to consider a very simple scenario to get started with. So we have provided you a link to open up the block diagram editor. <coughs> so the page would look something like this on your uh, if you are opening up on a Firefox. So if you Going to this particular link, you would actually, uh, if, if you have enabled the Java uh, JRE plugin, uh, if you are actually running a uh, previous version of Java JRE plugin, you will actually have uh, provided with this particular exception message and you can just accept that and allow that particular message. And you can consider if the version is out of date, you can consider you can update it later. It's not a problem. So that will actually in the background, it will open up the block diagram editor for you using which you can uh, uh, create the models as I am uh, going uh, through this uh, uh, model construction process itself. Okay, so as a step-by-step uh, -step guide, we have the we have provided a link over here. If you open up in, in the browser, you can actually see the step-by-step -step guide to build this particular model as well, all the way from a block diagram editor. So what I'm going to do at this particular point is uh, this is the hard uh, this is the block diagram that I was uh, talking about, and if we actually have a kind of detail. Uh, uh, block diagram, for example, the requests that are coming from the processor, uh, the kind of information that you would have includes what is the size of the request itself and what is the priority associated with that particular request and then what would be the kind of uh, time delay that you are expecting so that you may not really have upfront so that may be actually captured in the uh, later process. And then what you have here is you have a queue which actually models your uh, buffer inside your bus itself and then you have the process delay associated with the arbitration uh, uh, process itself. So that completes your bus itself in, at the system level and you don't really have to have a detailed pin level information to, to model uh, this performance uh, level system itself. So completely assembled model would look something like this. You would actually have a digital simulator and you will have a few blocks over here to model 
the kind of scenarios what we what you have here for example you have a queue defined in the block diagram and we have a queue block itself which actually models the queuing process and then for process delay or for arbitration delay we have considered a, a considered a, a delay block itself what it does is it'll actually uh, delay that particular uh, request for a certain time period and then it will send the transaction out so what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to go over to the um, modeling environment. So the, this particular window that you are looking at is actually uh, the new block diagram editor window that is available online. So you can actually uh, access this particular block diagram editor as well. Uh, if you can't access right now, you can actually uh, try it later and uh, we can actually provide you the step-by-step -step guide once again to uh, to build up this particular tutorial as well. So first and foremost is that you need to have a digital simulator to simulate the system architecture. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to have this uh, simulator called digital. And if I double click on this particular simulator, I have actually provided with certain set of parameters. So all I need to care over here is to stop time, how long I'm actually running my simulation for this particular model. I'm going to say that it, the simulation is going to last for about 10 seconds. And then what you have uh, here is you will actually have a, um, a queuing resource. For example, if I go over here, So I have a queuing resource over here, and um, I, I can rename the block whatever the name I want to have. For example, I can call this as a bus. And if I double click on this particular block, I have provided with certain parameters as well here. So I can set what exactly the name that I want to give for this. And um, I can keep the other parameters as it is. For example, I can use the parameters as priority. So what it does is, based on the priority of the incoming transaction, it will reorder the transactions inside the queue itself. So that way, uh, the highest priority tasks will be always served first. And in this case, I'm going to consider only a single queue. Uh, if you want to have multiple queues, you can actually have that as well. For example, if you consider a crossbar switch, in that you may actually have multiple lanes as well. So that may require uh, multiple queues to make sure that there is no contention between the transactions going through that particular crossbar switch itself. So I'm going to set this a queue type to first come first out and I'm going to commit this. So if I compare this with the with the block diagram, what I have, I have modeled my queue over here right now. And in addition to that, what I really need is I need a transaction generator or, or, or the, that actually emulates my processor uh, itself that generates the requests for my, for my uh, queue or for my bus itself. So in this case, I have instantiated a block called traffic generator or it is called as traffic transaction source. So I'm going to set this to one here or timing distribution as fixed, which means every one second, I'm going to send out a transaction out from this particular uh, transaction source block. So you might be actually uh, wondering, for example, what exactly is a transaction? So transaction is actually a combination of multiple fields. Uh, for example, what is a source name, destination name, size of the data, and uh, priority of that particular transaction itself and where exactly the transaction is going into, something like that, which you can actually directly correlate with uh, struct in the C language. So it will actually have combination of multiple information encapsulated in a uh, struct file. So you can also compare or correlate this with uh, the pin level details that you would actually look at uh, RTL level itself. So in this scenario, we don't really look at the acknowledgments uh, or the messages going from pin to pin. Instead, we actually encapsulate all those uh, uh, information in a single struct file and send it as a transaction. So that's why we call it as a transaction level modeling. 
So by setting this particular value 1 to 1.0, I'm going to say that um, sending uh, one transaction out every one second. So until I finish my simulation time, it will keep on sending the transactions out. So in addition to that, you might have noticed in the block diagram that I had few fields. For example, I had, the f I had fields such as priority and uh, I can have ad additional fields as well. For example, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in a block called, um, uh, actually in the latest version of, of the tool, we call it as an expression list. So here, what we have here is uh, you will actually end, you will be able to enter your uh, additional fields that you want to add or the kind of mathematical computations that you want to compute. You can actually do it in this particular expression list. The way how it works is you are going to enter the fields. For example, if I say input dot priority, uh, which is equal to integer random number all the way from one to ten. So this is going to generate a, a random uh, priority number between 1 to 10 every time this block gets triggered. And then I'm going to uh, make one more field called um, execution length, which means uh, how long I'm actually expecting this particular transaction to, uh, to be there in my bus arbiter. So this could completely vary, but I'm actually considering very straightforward uh, approach here. I'm actually considering, for example, it can stay up to 2.5 to uh, uh, 4.2 uh, seconds. Uh, it may take uh, to go across my bus itself. So I'm going to connect this particular block by pulling the um, output port from here to uh, the expression list block. And then I'm going to connect this output port to uh, the bus block. So in this case, what I'm going to do is, if I look over here, the priority field is named as uh, priority here. And the same field I'm actually using in my queue block as well. For example, the priority field, what I have provided here, is provided with this uh, priority uh, as a uh, name here. So by looking at the incoming transaction fields, it will actually uh, pick that particular field itself and uh, look at the value, what is assigned with that, and based on that, it will reorder the transactions that are available in that particular queue itself. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, run the model to give you a feel about how exactly the transactions would look like. So we have a kind of feature called debugging. So the way how it works is you just right click on this particular transaction source or any other ports in the middle of the port here, right click on that and if you do a listen to port, it will actually open up a text window and if you go ahead and run the button, run button, you can actually see the transactions that are coming out. If you see here, I'm actually running the transactions for about 10 seconds and here I can see the transactions that are coming out. In this case, we are using a default uh, uh, data structure, which is called header data structure. And that actually provided with a few set of fields, for example, which block it is generating and uh, what is the name of that particular data structure is and what is the ID associated with individual transactions. For example, if you see here, the first one is provided with an ID of one, second one is two, three and four, it goes on like that. So if you have added any additional fields that will get added to this particular uh, transaction. To give you an idea how exactly it works, I'm going to look at or uh, listen to the output port of expression list block here. If you notice, I have added two additional fields for that. And um, if I look over here, the transactions that are coming out, I can see here the field execution length and priority is being added to, to the transactions that is going out or, or to the data structure that is going out. So this way you can actually add or delete or um, manipulate any or data structure fields uh, using these uh, blocks itself. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one more block which actually models my uh, which, which actually models 
the um, a delay for, for, for my system, which means the processing delay associated with that. So I'm going to pull a delete, uh, sorry, delay block from here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the value called um, execution length, which is actually defined in the expression list block over here. So whenever I actually put the fields in double colon, this means that you're actually trying to access the data structure field and uh, the value associated with that particular field will be considered over here. So at this point what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one more block because I need to pop out the transactions that are available in the uh, buffer of my um, in, in the queue over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to instantiate one more uh, decision or it is called as a expression list block and I'm going to say output value as one. The reason I'm doing here is I have only one queue defined and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop out head of the queue whenever I receive a trigger from this particular output port. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to flip this for, for look and feel. I'm going to flip this particular port by going appearance and flip port horizontally. I'm going to connect this particular output to pop input port of the bus over here. And I generated a diamond uh, port by clicking on control and a mouse click. So the reason is I need to actually, I need, um, I need to compute the delay that is associated with this particular uh, portion or my bus plus queue itself. So I'm going to compute the delay associated with this by entering the field such as t now minus input dot time. So the way how it works is t now returns the current timestamp at what time the transaction arrived at this particular uh, block itself. And input.time gives me the information on at what time that particular transaction was actually generated uh, from the traffic generator or from the processor. Okay, so I'm, I just defined that very simple expression over there to compute the end-to-end -end latency. So I can rename this particular block as whatever I want. Okay, so once I'm done with that, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect a plotter to plot the transactions or the latency that I have computed. So I added a plotter, which is actually a time versus data plotter, and this completes my complete simulation setup for my uh, system model over here. So if I see here, the this particular bus plus delay block with an expression list to block is actually my uh, bus itself or I can say bus plus arbiter. In this case this is a very simple but what you can do is you can actually connect a very detailed arbitration algorithm that uh, controls that uh, buffer or, or the queue uh, itself or the tr sending the transaction out of that particular queue itself. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run the uh, simulation here and trying to see what exactly the simulation reports that I'm going to get. So if you see here, I'm actually getting an exponential uh, high uh, dots here, so which means I just I can see only two transactions that are coming out of this particular buffer or, or the bus itself. The reason could be multiple. One thing is that the delay that you have defined in this particular execution length is very high. Your arbitration delay is very high and you're not sending the transaction out at the uh, expected time what you're looking for. 
or it could be that your uh, the transactions that are coming in are at a very slower rate. So what I can do at this particular point is I can check what is the execution length delay that I have provided. In this case, it is 2.5 and 4.2, while I'm actually running my model only for until uh, 10 seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually reduce this execution length by entering, uh, by reducing this particular uh, delay over here, and I'm going to run the BUT uh, simulation again. So what you see at this point is you can see a lot of transactions that are coming in. Initially, there is a lot of buffering activities, but later on, your uh, a buff arbiter is actually quite uh, picking up. So at this point, what I can do for this particular model is I can actually add some additional dynamics. For example, I can consider my bus is running at certain uh, data speed. For example, I can say I have a parameter called bus speed. I'm actually running the bus at uh, 200 megahertz. And what I can do is, in addition to that, I can have another parameter or um, I can actually stick with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this particular parameter in the expression list over here. So what I'm doing now here is I'm going to define a field called data size. So I'm going to make it make the data size as completely random. For example, it can be all the way from 32 bytes to uh, 256 bytes. Okay, so the execution length or the time that it takes can be completely variable right now. For example, it could be based on the size of the data that you're handling as well. For example, I'm going to divide this by bus speed. So this is going to give you uh, the delay associated with uh, the data size itself and, and the rate at which you're running that particular bus uh, itself. Okay, so again, I'm going to run the model right now. So what you can see here is you can actually see a kind of quite um, a difference in the uh, in the transactions that are coming out as well. For example, what you can do is, for example, I can make it as as we consider in bytes. I can consider in bits as well. Okay, so in addition to that, what else you can do with this particular uh, simulation exercise is increase the rate at which the transactions that are coming in as well. For example, instead of sending transactions at every one second, what happens if I send at every 100 milliseconds? So if you see here, the transactions that are coming out are at a very higher rate right now. And also you can see here, the latency that you're seeing here is about 10 mi microseconds of latency that you're getting over here. So here, x-axis is your simulation time. Um, you can actually do that, simulation time versus um, latency in seconds. Also, you can change the name, whatever you want to have. In this case, I'm actually capturing the end-to-end -end latency for, 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 my, for the transactions that are going across my bus itself. So let us do a kind of simple uh, computation now. What happens if I decrease the bus speed here? So definitely, I can actually expect uh, the latency incre increment by uh, twice here. Earlier my maximum latency was about 10 microseconds, but now I can see here the maximum latency is about 20 microseconds over here. So this is a kind of very simple uh, model. Uh, you would actually do this, these kind of models at a very uh, initial uh, stages of your design process in which you have not identified which is your arbiter that you're going to select or how exactly the topology of the system would look like. and uh, uh, and, and the kind of bottleneck analysis and all you can do at this particular level itself. So, for example, let us say consider you have a very detailed or, or kind of custom arbitration that you might have uh, that you might have with you. So, in that case, the way how it works is, for example, if if I look at this particular model over here. I hope you can see it. So in this case, what I have here is a queuing resource with a deficit uh, round-robin algorithm, which is actually defined using our scripting language. 
Whereas in this case, I have about three different transactions or traffic sources. Uh, you can consider uh, five different processors that are actually going across a particular uh, resource or it could be uh, like a kind of crossbar switch or something like that. And at the bottom, you can see here the, the, the algorithm that we have written inside this particular uh, smart controller block itself. Okay, so the way how it works in this scenario is earlier case we actually had only one uh, queuing resource, but in this case we have about five different queuing resources, which means I have diff five different uh, uh, master resources that are actually uh, talking to a different set of slave devices that are going through my crossbar switch. So here to model my crossbar switch, I have uh, modeled a uh, queuing resources with dedicated uh, channels. So these five different channels or queues will actually enable me to uh, send the transactions without having any kind of contention for resources. Okay, so um, if I go ahead and open up this particular block, you can actually see here the way how it works is it's a deficit round robin here. It's very simple. We actually keep on looking at the length of that particular queuing resource itself if I'm actually at queue number one. So whether I have something in that particular queue itself and if I have anything, so I'll actually wait for, for the controller time period and then send out that uh, trigger to pop out the transaction from that particular queue itself. So you can actually have a very complex algorithms defined here as well. And if I go ahead and run the model for this, I'm actually looking at varieties of things. For example, I'm looking at the end-to-end -end, uh, latency itself. If you see here, initially the latency was very less, but later on, uh, as you go along the uh, simulation time, it is actually kind of building up the buffer uh, uh, requirements itself. So you need to have a kind of huge set of um, buffer space availability to be able to uh, run the model without any uh, uh, data loss or things like that. Okay, so I hope um, you're following me uh, through this particular tutorial and um, if you have any questions please post any your questions in the uh, chat window if you're looking for any specific uh, questions or things like that. So at this point what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, introduce some errors to the model itself to be able to kind of understand if there are any kind of problems in the model, how can I debug my system model itself. For example, one thing would be I have a parameter called bus speed over here which I have utilized in the expression list over here and let us say I have done a kind of typo error and if I go ahead and run the model, so what it is going to give you is uh, it gives you an error message saying that the expression itself is not valid because that bus p is undefined and you don't really have that particular uh, parameter. So this actually provides you information what exactly is the problem is and in which block uh, you really have the particular problem. So it actually highlights in the right color over here. So you can immediately go ahead and, and uh, make the changes to it. And other common uh, problem that we actually uh, come across is while using the data structure fields itself. For example, you would actually have um, um, kind of uh, via visual sim is actually case sensitive. For example, instead of having a uh, capital letter L, you might have you might have entered a small small letter L. So in the same way, we actually provide the uh, error message as well. So in this case, we are actually saying that field not found, which means we are actually looking for an execution length field here and that field itself is not available in the incoming transaction. So you can actually uh, display the stack trace and you can see what exactly or which block it, the problem is with. And also it highlights in the red color as well. So you can go ahead and um, make the changes to, to, to get it working. 
okay and in addition to that if you have uh, built up a fairly complicated uh, model with a lot of dependencies and all and you want to make uh, or you want to understand how exactly the transactions are going between different blocks itself you can actually have a animated uh, execution as well for example you can set the whole time here and run the model and try to understand how exactly the transactions are going through so every um, transactions or, or the transfers are highlighted in in the uh, red color okay so that's with the basic uh, model that we uh, that we were talking about okay so the next tutorial that I would like to consider for now is a uh, selection of a scheduling algorithm itself. Okay, so for example, we are considering a scenario with uh, three different tasks that are going to run on a single uh, processing resource, and you want to understand uh, which is going to be the best uh, routing algorithm, sorry, scheduling algorithm that meets your uh, performance requirements uh, and things like that. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to generate these diff different tasks using combination of uh, 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 traffic generators and uh, expression lists and a few other blocks that I'm going to show you or talk about uh, in a little bit. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to go to the Visual Sim environment. I'm, I'm going to create a new block diagram editor as I'm actually using the tool right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, instantiate a digital simulator, so which is the one thing that you need to do all the time. And you're going to define how long you're going to run the model. And then what you're going to do is you're going to uh, have three different traffic generators to model your three different uh, requests coming from different resources. And uh, in addition to that, what you're going to do is you're going to have a uh, processing resource or a scheduling resource. So we call it as a system resource. So I'm going to have it over here. And if I double click on that, I can provide the name associated with that. I'm going to just call it as a scheduler. So I'm going to leave all the other parameters as it is, for example, including the clock speed at which it was running or, or the scheduler itself. So I'm going to go with a first come first serve basis. So in order to map uh, the same transactions coming from different uh, resources to a uh, processing resource, what I need is I need a block called mapper. So I'm going to need three different mappers to map the incoming transactions over to the system resource that I have over here. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy this particular name and I'm going to say that my parent scheduler name is scheduler. I'm going to provide the task number as one and task priority as one and uh, task time as about three seconds. For the second one, I'm going to say this, uh, the parent scheduler name as uh, scheduler and task number as 2 and priority as 2 and task time as 3.0. So which means uh, this particular task, the second task is actually having highest priority than the first one. In visual same, higher the number, higher the priority. I'm going to do the same here. I'm going to consider the task as 3 priority as 3 and the task time as 3.0. So my third task is actually having highest priority over here. Looking at the traffic generator, what I have here, so I'm actually generating the very first task at 0 seconds over here and after that it is going to generate at um, every 1 second. And the second one, I'm going to uh, delay it for about uh, 2 seconds and after that every one second and the third one I'm going to generate it at four seconds and after that every one second I'm going to generate but in this case I'm actually selecting the timing distribution as a single event which means I'm going to generate only one trigger out of these particular uh, traffic generators so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to look at how exactly the transactions are going to uh, processed in the 
uh, system resource. So I'm going to connect this particular plotter output to the uh, to a um, graph graphic display, and I'm going to run the model. So running the model, what you can see over here is what you can see over here is maybe I'll keep that grid as it is. So this is your first task that is actually running and it is actually running for three seconds. Once it is completed, the second task actually uh, started executing and then the third task started executing. So you are actually going in a specific order here. So you received your first uh, task first and you are processing that first and then take the next one and take the next one. So this actually shows you how exactly the uh, first come first serve process is actually being processed. So if I go ahead and change the scheduler type over here from first come first serve to preemption, at this point, we actually consider the priorities that are associated with these different uh, blocks itself. So I just made this a scheduler type from first come first serve to a preemption basis, and I'm going to run the model. And the simulation report shows me that uh, first one started executing at zero simulation time, and it was actually stalled at two seconds over here because of the highest priority task, uh, task number two. And task number two started executing, but it was actually interrupted by the high, next higher priority task, task three, which, which was actually arriving at four seconds. So if you see here, the third task actually completes its processing without any kind of interruptions or preemptions. So it will get completed. And then the next highest priority task, which is actually task two, uh, will be taken from the preemption queue and it starts processing. And once it is over, the next high priority task will be actually considered over here. So this actually the way, the purpose of having these uh, different set of resources is that you can actually utilize these system resource blocks to model your processor itself or a uh, uh, scheduling algorithm itself or you can use this as a uh, real-time operating system that actually uh, serves the transactions that are coming in at different intervals with different set of priorities. So this is a kind of benefit that you're going to get uh, using this uh, system resource and mapper blocks. Okay. So with that, I'm going to move over to a, a next tutorial. And um, I'm going to, uh, if, if you have any questions, please post in your questions in the chat window. I can go back and I can address those uh, problems if there are any. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to consider for today's uh, training program is um, a dual processor design. So in this case, what we are going to consider is uh, two CPUs uh, that are connected with a DRAM and a cache uh, using a bus itself. So what I'm going to do uh, in this uh, modeling exercises, I'm going to construct this particular model with two CPUs, but for CPUs, I'm going to consider the system resource as a, as a CPU, but it can be replaced with a detailed uh, processor model as well. But I'm going to consider a very detailed um, bus and very detailed cache and DRAM blocks, which actually helps you in uh, considering or uh, kind of correlating uh, the system model with your uh, system architecture, what you are having with you. So the purpose of doing this particular exercise is to understand uh, the, uh, the kind of overhead, the uh, memory access or memory reference overhead on the uh, total system performance. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to move over to a modeling environment and I'm going to go with a new uh, block diagram editor and I'm going to ins instantiate the digital simulator as I did before. So at this point what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, instantiate few set of parameters for example uh, to, to, to make it more dynamic. So I'm going to call this as call a parameter called sim time. 
So this may not be a kind of uh, functional value, but it actually helps you in changing the simulation times and things like that. I'm going to run this for 50 seconds. And in addition to that, I'm going to consider some of the fields such as what is going to be my CPU uh, processing time, or processing time in my CPU itself. I'm going to consider this as a 6.0 e power minus 6, but uh, consider that this particular delay uh, will be actually a combination of of uh, which is your uh, instruction set that you're considering and all that. But in this case, we are considering a statistical CPU, not a detailed CPU, but it can be replaced. Um, in, the, in the upcoming tutorials, we will be actually showing you how exactly you can build a cycle accurate level uh, processor model and work with this, the rest of the system. I'm going to have other fields such as clock speed for, for the uh, DRAM itself. I'm going to run this at uh, 250 megahertz and then I'm going to have one more uh, field called cache speed. I'm going to run this also at uh, 250 megahertz and in addition to that I will actually have a bus speed as well. Oops, I'm sorry. And then I'm going to have to understand, oops, I'm going to change this um, name to, I'm going to run this at 250 uh, megahertz again. I'm going to insert a few more fields. For example, I'm going to say what is the rate at which the transactions arrive. I'm going to initially, I'm going to set this to every one second. And uh, what what is going to be the data size that we are going to handle? So I may not use this for now. Maybe I'll add it later. So with this, what I'm going to do is, uh, if I look at the hardware or uh, the block diagram of the proposed system architecture, I can see there are two CPUs and a bus and a cache and DRAM. So I'm going to model that particular uh, hardware architecture right now. And to do that, what I'm going to do is to model the CPUs, I'm going to use the block called System Resource Extended. I'm going to uh, call this, or I'm going to double click on this and call this as CPU1. I'm going to set this to add scheduler DS. The, the reason for enabling this particular message is I'll be knowing what is the total delay the CPU actually consider for processing a particular task, including the memory reference times as well. I'm going to instantiate one more block by just copying it, call it as CPU2. So in addition to that, what I need, uh, in addition to processors, what I need is I need blocks to uh, model the bus interface itself. Right now, I'm going to consider a custom bus arbiter, which you can actually simply replace with an ARM by HB or an uh, AXI bus and things like that. I'm going to use our basic building blocks to model a bus arbiter. In this case, I'm actually considering a bus arbiter, which is actually running at first come, first serve mode. And I'm going to set this bus speed to the parameter that I actually used. And I'm calling this particular bus as bus one. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just change this particular port name as we need uh, unique names for each uh, port. And what I need now is I need a RAM or a memory. And in addition to that, I need a cache block as well. I'm going to connect these blocks together over here. And by double clicking on this particular block, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this as just a cache. I'm going to uh, set this cache speed here. And cache hit expression, I'm going to consider uh, L2 cache. This, this you can consider as an L2 cache, which is external to your processor. 
I'm going to consider this as about 98% of uh, hit rate. And I'm going to set this, the name of this particular DRAM as just DRAM and set the clock speed as DRAM speed and memory type I'm going to consider as double uh, data rate. And the access times I'm going to consider as 5 nanoseconds and uh, 9 nanoseconds for erase and 7 uh, nanoseconds for uh, for write operations. I'm going to set this as default and size of the memory is I have considered as 64 megabytes of memory. So this actually completes your uh, the two CPUs and a bus and a ca cache and a DRAM. In order to connect uh, these system resource blocks to uh, the rest of the system model we need a block called uh, device interface uh, which is which may not be a part of the real hardware, but it actually helps in VisualSim as a interface unit that helps in uh, communicating between these blocks, but this doesn't really add any additional delays or performance related stuff. I'm going to call this as CPU1 and the destination of this particular uh, block is going to be the cache because it is coming, the requests are coming from a uh, processor. I'm going to consider as read operation. It could be uh, write as well. Uh, for this, I'm going to stick with read. And uh, the bytes, it could be decided by the processor. So how many bytes that you're actually requesting for. I'm going to stick with 32 bytes of data over here. OK, so I'm going to have a same instance with just a name change of from CPU1 to CPU2 over here. Okay, I'm going to connect this output port of the system resource to device interface, but before that we need to consider one scenario. For example, what happens if there is a cache hit or a cache miss, or, or, or you already have the data available in the registers in your processor. The way how we do it is um, we consider a simple expression to to compute that. So I'm going to come to that in a little bit. I'm going to connect this up over here. And we need to release this particular uh, system resource extended. Otherwise, um, it will be considered as still processor is looking for the messages or, or the data from the memory itself. So the way how it works is the transactions arrives at this particular CPU block and it will based on the conditions that you're going to define if you already have the data available in the CPU or if you don't have. If you don't have, it will actually go and get the data from the cache or DRAM and once you have the data available, available you will actually re, uh, release this particular uh, CPU uh, core itself. That actually models your complete uh, uh, memory access related uh, flow itself. Okay, so I'm going to need the same for the second one as well. The way how we, how we do is we actually we're going to look for a field called input or for example if the this field I'm going to add it later but I'm going to add here if I have or if I need um, cache data for example I'm looking for a string variable or a string I'm going to send it out through my output port and if I don't need, I'm going to send it through a port called reg, which I'm going to add it uh, in a little bit. And then I have this need data. I'm going to set this to reg here. I'm going to uh, come back to this in a little bit. And now, as we need one more port, I'm going to go to customize and customize ports. And I'm going to add a uh, line here. And again, name this as reg. And um, here we are going to select um, the output port here and I'm going to set the direction as south 
because that is more convenient for me. I'm going to set this to commit and I can see that particular port has been generated. So I can actually send this to here. So the way how it works over here is if we have the transactions available in the process itself, you don't really have to go to memory and get the data and you can immediately release, release that particular process core itself. So that's why or if you do not have the memory or instructions, you will actually have to go and get the data from there. Okay, so I'm going to just um, make these connections. Okay, so this completes my hardware architecture, but in order to explore, in order to understand how exactly this architecture is going to work for me, I need a behavior flow, I need a workload, and I need uh, use cases to run this particular model and try to understand what is my end-to-end -end latency and things like that. To model that, what I need is I'm going to instantiate, a, again, the traffic generators. But in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a data structure called processor or data structure. The major reason for using that particular data structure is, as I mentioned earlier, a data structure is combination of multiple fields that are going to go across all the uh, modeling blocks that we have in the system. And the blocks that we have or the libraries that we have in the uh, model can look for a certain set of fields and they can actually pick the values from that and do, uh, do the required processing. So the blocks that you have seen over here, which includes uh, the bus arbiter, cache, and uh, DRAM, for example, if you consider a DRAM, you need address for that particular memory location. And you may need uh, the commands such as uh, what, what, whether it is a read command or write command. And you also need to know where exactly the transactions are uh, come from and where exactly it must go back. So all those field details are actually already uh, predefined in this pro processor DS and we are going to reuse that particular uh, data structure itself. Okay, so I'm going to generate this at every one second or I, I'm actually going to use this task rate uh, field to control the task rate coming from or, or, or my workload uh, rate itself. So in this expression list, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, model a certain set of scenarios. For example, how do I select my uh, the availability of or how do I select uh, between two processors? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, add a, a random number to, to select between uh, processor 1 and processor 2 in this case. I'm going to call this as uh, processor select. And I'm going to call this as an integer random. If it is 0, it goes to one processor. If it is 1, it goes to another. So I'm going to call this as a destination, or it can be anything. I'm going to use some name. And I'm going to use this particular field here, process cell. And if it is process cell is equal to 0, and you're going to go into CPU 1. Otherwise, you will be going to CPU 2. So this is a very simple uh, if-else statement that I have over here. So in addition to that, what else you need is you need to know whether uh, there is a uh, need for the data from the, pro uh, from the memory or it is already available. So here we are actually doing an assumption saying that about 60% of the time you already have, you will have the data available in the processor and remaining 40% you will have to go and get the data from your cache or from the DRAM. So that particular assumption what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, generate one more uh, random number. Okay, so I'm going to call this as random between uh, uh, 1.0 to 100.0 and I'm going to call a, or define a field called need data and it can be anything. I'm going to look at this particular value, what exactly this particular value has been generated. If it is less than 60, 
I'm actually saying that uh, the data is already available in the register. If it is not, I need to go and get the data from the uh, cache. Uh, I can consider there is a cache hit. Okay, so this is all I need in this particular block itself. So I need to know where exactly I'm going and whether I need the data from my uh, external memory or I, or I already have it. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm actually using this particular field in the expression list that I have uh, defined earlier. So I had uh, provided a name called need data is equal to cache it or if it is uh, reg. Okay, and just make it, uh, yeah, it is perfect. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm gonna, I need to map the transactions that are actually generated over to the hardware architecture which I have defined at the top. So I'm going to introduce a block called mapper again. I'm going to use the field here, this uh, a destination to know the parent scheduler name because this can be completely dynamic based on, um, on the random number that I have selected. It can be either CPU1 or it could be either CPU2. Okay, and um, um, I can actually make it more interesting. Um, I'm going to set this priority as one here. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to consider any priorities here. And the time that it takes in the CPU, I'm actually using the parameter called CPU time. I'm going to commit this. Actually, this particular model is complete now. So this includes your hardware architecture as well, and this includes your uh, workload and it includes your use cases that you have defined and the mapping to the hardware architecture itself. But running this simulation will not really give you any uh, information because you need to capture the reports to understand how exactly the system is working with. So to enable that, what we are going to do is we are going to generate some reports out of this particular model. And what I'm going to do now is, oops, um, I'm going to add one more expression list block and I'm going to understand what is the uh, uh, time delay that is actually uh, elapsed in the process itself. So we are actually looking for a particular field called time response, which is actually being added or uh, updated by the uh, CPU block over here. And by connecting a plotter to output power of this particular expression list must actually give me the end-to-end -end latency. But before that, what we need is we need a block called architecture setup, which actually maintains the communications between all these different uh, blocks itself. For example, communication or uh, routing details between bus and cache and, and the uh, system resource itself. So if I go ahead and run the model, oops, okay. So what, what you can see at this point is you're actually seeing an error message saying that digital stop time parameter is too large. So I forgot to set this particular value into the stop time over here and I'm gonna add that. And I'm again, I'm gonna run the model, try to understand what is really happening. So running the simulation is actually giving me a graph over here, which is actually the end-to-end -end latency across my system platform. Okay, so what you notice over here is the dots that you're seeing at 6.0 is actually telling you that the transactions actually uh, need not go to the external memory to access the data from, uh, from cache or memory, but you actually had those instruction or data already available in the processor. That's why your latency is actually only six over here, but there is, there are a few tasks that are actually going to get the data from the external memory at certain time period, sorry, uh, from the cashier. And there is also once the, uh, we had to go and get the data from the DRAM as well. So that was actually an additional uh, uh, latency that it was actually caused. 
So what I can do with this particular model is I can do multiple uh, level of explorations. So one thing is that I can change the clock speed of these different resources and I can vary the rate at which the transactions are arriving at the process. For example, what happens if I uh, send or if workload interval from one seconds to 100 milliseconds? So what is the impact of that? So what you see over here is kind of lots and lots of transactions that are going into your architecture and that are being processed. And also a very good thing over here is that uh, most of the times there are tasks or are, are, are the processor is already having the data available and you don't really have to go and get the data from the cache or the external memory. But there is there are certain time period you are actually going and getting the data from the cache, but th that looks quite good and you may actually meet your uh, end-to-end -end requirements uh, if you are going with this particular hardware configurations. And if you are not happy with that, for example, what you would do is you may actually increase the or change the memory technology what you're selecting or you would actually replace this particular bus with a different set of bus architectures, for example. What happens if I'm going to select a AMBA bus and uh, I'm going to connect the blocks. Okay, so I'm going to again uh, tell this as the clock speed of my bus, uh, AMBA bus itself. I'm going to run this for the same speed at which I have defined over here. Okay, so what you notice over here is by introducing AMBA bus over here, you are actually seeing a different set of problems at this particular point. The major reason is that AMBA bus is, will keep on uh, waiting for an acknowledgement from the uh, destination resource. And if you do not receive that particular acknowledged message, your bus will be blocked. And that's why if your bus is being blocked, you're actually kind of trying to overflow or kind of uh, queuing up lots and lots of transactions in the processor itself because you're in, the, in a kind of waiting state. So in this case, what, you, what the error message that you saw over here is actually telling that the buffer or the kind of uh, ex, uh, instruction queue length is actually uh, overflowing. So you need to either change the topology how you're working with or increase the speed at which you're running the resource, or uh, select a different set of configurations for the, for the hardware architecture. In this case, what you noticed over here is with a simple uh, bus architecture, uh, which was not looking for any acknowledgement from the uh, destination resources, the uh, processors were actually able to process all the transactions that are coming through with if they are successful or not. With uh, introduction of this AHB, we are actually seeing a problem of uh, overflow in terms of system resource uh, queue itself or, or the uh, instruction queue itself. Okay, so this is a kind of a different set of problems that you are uh, looking at uh, right now. Okay, so you can again go back and change and have the architecture as it is. And what else you can do with this is you can um, introduce the concept of uh, data size as well. For example, introducing a data size over here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this field over here. I forgot to add the value associated with that. I'm going to say this is about 64 bytes. Oops. Um, oh, here it is. So it is, it is going to be uh, 64 bytes of data that I'm going to consider. I'm going to use that same um, A bytes over here, which is actually will be utilized to perform uh, memory read and writes because based on the size of the data that you're requesting as well, the delay across these arbiters and the memory uh, access time will uh, vary accordingly. 
So the, as you noticed here, you're actually seeing a kind of little bit increased in uh, cache access and um, memory access times itself. So which is actually increased uh, a little bit because we have actually uh, varied the size of the data that we are working with here. Okay, so this this actually uh, kind of provides you information on how exactly a, uh, a combination of cycle accurate with a uh, a statistical processor model would look like. At this point, I would like to kind of go uh, show you a simple model with um, for a MPEG multimedia processing. Um, give me one second. Here it is. For example, in this case, what you're seeing over here is a uh, MPEG-4 encoding algorithm. Uh, which is actually modeled as part of hardware architecture and, and the algorithm itself. Here, what we have here is the behavior flow for the algorithm that we are uh, running on the target platform. And at the top, we have a statistical uh, dual processor model with a statistical bus cache and SDRAM. And what we are doing over here is all these different functions that I have defined over here can be running on either on a DSP1 or DSP Core 2. And that mapping details we are actually entering using a table, which, which can be a CSV file, by looking at uh, different functions and running on different set of cores. For example, if you see here, bitstream unpack is actually being run on DSP core 1, whereas quantizations and DCDs and all running on DSP core 1, sorry, core 2. A detailed model of, with a detailed processor model would look something like um, here. So if you notice over here, the Bottom portion, which is actually your application behavior sequence, is exactly the same thing, but only uh, we have updated uh, with a detailed processor blocks here, and also a bus architecture with an AXI bus and a DDR4 memory over here. But if I look at this particular processor block, which is actually having a certain set of fields, for example, it tells me how many number of execution units I have and um, what is the rate at which I'm running my process itself and how many ex uh, cache execution units I have. In this case, I have uh, L1 cache and L2 cache here. If there is an L2 miss, I'm actually going and getting the data from a DDR4 memory. And also, I have defined the uh, pipeline stages for the processor that I'm selecting as well. And AXI bus is a standard block that we offer you can actually utilize this particular block to uh, understand the benefit that you are going to get and also the type of arbitration algorithm that you must use to get better performance as well. Here in this case, we are actually selecting a fixed priority uh, arbitration algorithm over here. Okay. And this you could replace with any of your uh, custom bus protocols or technologies as well. So running the simulation for this particular model, what, what we would expect at this point is uh, what, are, what is going to be my uh, utilization of my processes that I have, how much utilization that I can actually uh, expect. And also these timing diagrams will actually allow me to debug uh, the activities that are happening in the processor block itself. For example, at what time your uh, register read and write operations are happening, and when you are actually invoking your L1 cache or L2 cache, and whether uh, the bus refresh message is actually sent at the right time or not, and things like that. And also, in addition to that, we capture the end-to-end -end latency over here as well. For example, how much time I have actually taken to process all the uh, functions that I have defined for my MPEG encoding algorithm itself. Okay, and a detailed statistics on the hardware architectural resources, what I have here includes the utilization of my various uh, resources I have and utilization of the processor pipeline and um, in this case we are not capturing but you can capture the throughput of different resources that you are having in the target platform and things like that as well. The way, the kind of uh, 
flexibility that it provides you is, for example, what happens instead of running everything on the, uh, sorry, if, if running on dedicated Prasta Core, what happens if I run everything on a Prasta Core 1? So what is the impact on my uh, target platform over here? Okay, I'm, I'm going to run everything on my Prasta Core 1 or DSP Prasa 1 here and I'm going to not utilize uh, Prasa 2 and trying to understand what is the impact on the end-to-end -end latency. So uh, there is a question on whether uh, I'll be able to generate uh, RTL code out of this particular model. Uh, at this point, we don't really uh, support a generation of RTL code. The major reason is that if if uh, if the modeling environment is set up to generate a specific set of codes, the flexibility that a system level modeling tool will actually get lost, and you may not really actually have flexibility to make changes into the architecture in a greater way, and also the ability to conduct architecture exploration and performance level uh, at the system level will degrade in a, a greater number. And also the amount of time that you would actually take to construct those models will actually uh, increase uh, exponentially. So we don't really support uh, generation of RTL codes or any uh, sort of codes, but the reports that, we, that, that you generate out of these uh, models will actually provide uh, significant information on uh, how do I write my RTL code and why exactly I'm writing in a specific way. And, and also it allows you to introduce uh, various different scenarios to make sure that um, if uh, to, to be able to understand or uh, capture the kind of bottlenecks that you have to capture at the system level instead of at a RTL level debugging. So that is one of the benefit that we offer here. So when you see over here, the end-to-end -end latency that we are looking at is actually increased a little bit here. Earlier, the latency was below 0.5 uh, tempo minus 5, but in this case, it is actually increased exponentially here. So this actually tells you that what, what is the kind, how exactly you need to distribute your applications or tasks if in case you, you have combination of processors plus FPGA plus a custom ASIC board and trying to understand uh, the, the kind of uh, performance benefits that you would get with a combination of uh, distribution of these different tasks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back some of the tasks to PASA 2 and some of those running on the PASA 1 itself and I'm going to again run the model try to understand whether that improves the performance of my uh, system itself. Okay, so Uh, it is taking a little while to capture the end-to-end -end latency statistics for the processors. Okay, so yeah, that that is the way how you actually modify the parameters and uh, trying to understand how exactly your system is behaving for, for the set of parameters that you are actually providing uh, in the system uh, platform itself. Okay, so the uh, one of the additional points that I wanted to explain over here, but I'm not going to go into very details uh, over here because we are taking up these concepts in the upcoming training, scenario, uh, training programs. For example, one thing is that uh, when I talked about this uh, detailed PRASA model, we don't really run an operating system on top of, of this particular PRASA model because um, we are not doing any software debugging activity over here. Rather, we are actually doing an architecture exploration program, which don't really need an operating system running on the platform, but you need to capture or understand uh, the impact of a memory reference times on the uh, performance of your processor itself.
So in this case, we actually provide you a capability to define your own set of uh, instruction set that includes your mnemonics and associated with uh, cycle delays uh, for, for the mnemonics. You can define all your instruction set over here and then with the help of our profiler-based instruction generator, you can actually run these uh, different set of tasks that are quite similar to your uh, real applications that you're going to run in the real hardware platform itself. So this provides you more than 90 to 95 percent of accuracy in terms of uh, performance and uh, power, ca power consumptions. I'm going to talk about power consumptions in the upcoming webinar or upcoming training series, but for today's we are actually going to cover only the basics of these different concepts that I talked about. Okay. So this is what I actually wanted to cover for this particular uh, training program. As I have a few more minutes, I would like to go over a few demo examples to, to be able to kind of explain how exactly you can model an operating system uh, related stuff. I'm going to consider a model um, which is actually a part of an um, a, avionic system. In this case, what I have over here is a hardware system which is actually modeled using a statistical processor blocks and I have a detailed, uh, kind of fairly detailed scheduler or, or, or a uh, Ring 653 scheduler that I have with different set of partitions that I have in the, in the uh, system itself. For example, in this case, I have about seven uh, partitions or that are dedicated with a uh, time slots for each partitions. And over here, the scheduler, what it does is it actually keeps uh, buffers the transactions that are coming in. And based on the scheduling algorithm that you have defined, it will go through these different partitions and it will uh, uh, actually process the transactions uh, or the kind of requests that are available in that particular partition itself. The way how it works is we have defined that particular algorithm over here. We keep on looking at the uh, virtual machine or, or the partitioning itself and we keep on looking at it and uh, if, if something is there or any request is available in a particular partition, well we process that and uh, we elapse that particular partition time period and we go to the next uh, partition. So very simple script that we have written over here. So the purpose of doing this particular model is to understand if the tasks are actually meeting the timing deadlines that you might have uh, entered in the model itself. For example, in this case, we are actually capturing uh, uh, which are the tasks that are being uh, rejected or that are taking more time than expected. For example, the red one is actually taking more times as opposed to the other tasks that are getting completed in the given timing deadline itself. And also by looking at these uh, task completion times, you can see here most of the tasks that are under 1.5 are actually uh, nothing but they're actually meeting the timing deadlines. But there are some tasks that are actually going above 1.5. Those are actually exceeding the timing deadlines and they are considered as uh, rejected tasks or something like that as well. Okay. And also, if you see over here, this is actually the processing latency across virtual machines. As we have seven virtual machines, you can see here the virtual machine five or, or six is actually taking more uh, time to process instead of other uh, virtual machines such as one or two or three itself. So this actually provides you more information on how exactly my system uh, must be defined and how exactly I need to distribute tasks between multiple uh, processing resources and trying to understand if they are meeting my deadlines or things like that as well. Okay. So to conclude today's program, what we have learned, we actually learned how to quickly model a uh, statistical level a model. And also we looked at how exactly we can model a multi-core system platform and distribution of tasks between that to conduct architecture exploration and performance analysis. 
in case if you don't have any uh, application software or things like that available. And also we looked at some of the concepts such as data structure and trying to understand what exactly we are going to define in that particular data structure file itself and how the blocks are communicating between one uh, uh, block to another block as well. And also we looked at uh, configuring a system with uh, parameters and running varieties of simulation runs to, to be able to explore your system in a, uh, a greater extent as well. And uh, yeah, so that concludes uh, today's training and in, in our upcoming uh, training series, we are going to consider some of the con uh, complex con concepts such as how do I define a, uh, a cache subsystem itself or it could be an avionic system or how do I conduct power analysis and how do I model my own uh, processor itself and uh, uh, integrate that particular processor with my rest of the systems and things like that as well. And we are going to consider these concepts and also we keep on looking for your inputs as well. If you want to look at or if you want to learn any specific concepts, you can uh, mail us those details and we can take up uh, those concepts uh, in our, our training series as well. So now the session is open for our questions and answers and if you have any questions, please post in your questions in the chat window. And I can see that most of the questions are being answered in the uh, chat window. And uh, if, if you have any more, you can actually post in the questions in the chat window.